Uh, thrilled to welcome you to this afternoon's discussion uh, on the question of whether New York um, needs a constitutional convention to strengthen its government ethics. Thank you all for joining us in this conversation. It, this is part of an ongoing effort to educate the citizens of New York on some of the key issues they must face when they make the decision, when they go to the polls in November of 2017. While there are clearly momentous decisions voters must take up this November, next year voters in New York will face some critical, some, something critical to the future of the state, whether to consider the shape and contours of our Constitution, the government it forms, and the rights that it protects. We are grateful to host this discussion today and to work with our partners who are making these sorts of events and these conversations possible. Before I introduce our introductory speaker and our moderator for today's event, I want to acknowledge our partners on the educational effort around the Constitutional Convention. First and foremost, it is our honor at Albany Law School to work with the Rockefeller Institute of Government at the State University of New York, which under the steady and inspired leadership of Robert Bullock has helped bring this effort to fruition. In addition to Mr. Bullock, we also have Carl Hayden, board chair of the Rockefeller Institute uh, with us today. Uh, we are joined also in this partnership by the Benjamin Center for Public Policy Initiatives at SUNY New Paltz, the League of Women Voters of the State of New York, and the Siena Research Institute. You can follow all of the work of the partnership on the Rockefeller Institute homepage. Just click on the New York State Constitutional Convention tab on the right side of the page. Um, we also want to have a, a special thanks to our a special event sponsor for today, the New York State Bar Association. Representatives of this partnership have been taking this dialogue on the road and speaking at events throughout the state. They've discussed it at, 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 on tr in traditional settings, uh, in social media. It's really getting the word and the discussion out uh, on as many fronts as possible. Uh, in particular, in partnership with the New York State Bar Association, the Government Law Center here at Albany Law School will be publishing a book containing the co uh, a collection of essays on the topic uh, of the upcoming constitutional uh, convention, some of which were written by today's panelists. The book is being co-edited by Scott Fine, our Government Law Center uh, Advisory Board Chair, and our own Professor Rosemary Bailey, uh, together with our student editing team led by th uh, third-year law student Bill Davies. The book is due to be released in early September 2016. We're thrilled by all this activity and know that the people of the state of New York are in good hands through this partnership. As the agenda for the program makes clear, the wealth of combined ta talent and experience our speakers bring to the table today is simply breathtaking. Thank you to all of you for participating in this crucial conversation. Before I introduce our introductory speaker, let me first introduce a friend to the law school who will serve as the moderator for today's panel discussions, Hank Greenberg. Mr. Greenberg is a shareholder at Greenberg Traug. He is former counsel to the New York State Attorney General and general counsel to the New York State Department of Health among several prominent and prestigious positions. His bio is long, I'm not gonna read all of it, it's in your program and, and you can take a look at the highlights. I will mention that Hank just recently helped Albany Law School honor and celebrate the, the life and career of the late Chief Judge Judith Kaye for whom he clerked. He gave a stunningly beautiful tribute to, to our chief and I am sure that our chief judge would certainly appreciate the conversations that we are going to have today, as I'm sure she did the tribute. Um, two more quick items before I introduce Chairman McCall. Uh, first, some of you may, may have heard our good news at the law school. Um, Albany Law School was recently ranked number one in the nation for the study of government law and public service, number one. <laughs> Thank you. 
we beat American in Georgetown. <laughs> um, to all of you in the audience uh, who, who host our students, who mentor them, um, who hire them as interns or hire them after graduation, we are deeply grateful to you. We could not do what we do for our students in the area of government law and public service without all of you. So thank, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, Second, uh, we are going to be live tweeting our conversation today. I'm told that the hashtag is, up, is on the screen, New York Con Con Ethics, uh, and I'm asked to ask you to carry on the conversation into the Twittersphere. So if that's something, if you tweet, please tweet, uh, tweet freely. So now let me turn to introducing our esteemed introductory speaker. And it is a tremendous honor uh, to host our speaker and to be able to honor uh, Mr. Uh, the, the chairman of, of the um, State University of New York's Board of Trustees, Chairman H. Carl McCall. We are thrilled to have you here today uh, to provide, you can you stand up in a minute, I'm going to say some things, <laughs> if you don't mind. Um, almost 20 years ago today, um, on May 14, 1996, then New York State Controller McCall was here at Albany Law School. Uh, he gave the, the first ever Edwin L. Crawford Memorial Lecture, and presented, at, which was presented by our Government Law Center. It's a tradition that we carry on to this day. We are tremendously proud uh, to have had that event and, and to have as its first distinguished speaker, uh, Chairman McCall. It's part of our Al Albany Law School history and we're gonna make some more history today. Uh, chairman McCall has served as the chairman of the, the SUNY Board of Trustees since 2011, having first joined the board as a member in 2007. Mr. McCall served as the comptroller of the state of New York from 1993 to 2002. His distinguished career as a public servant also includes serving three terms as a New York State Senator representing Upper Manhattan, as an ambassador to the United Nations, as a commissioner of the Port Authority of New York and uh, New Jersey, and as a commissioner of the New York State Division of Human Rights. He served as the president of the New York City Board of Education for three years, uh, where he set policy for the largest school system in the nation. He was also the Democratic candidate for New York State Governor in 2002. He was educated at Dartmouth College, Andover Newton Theological Seminary, and the University of Edinburgh. Now with great pleasure, you can stand now. Chairman McCall, please join me in welcoming. <laughs> Madam President, thank you very much for that very nice uh, introduction. You know, all these things she said, I think, are uh, supposed to impress you. Uh, but let me tell you what happened to me recently. I went to a high school in Brooklyn. I like to go to schools and talk to kids. And the uh, principal introduced me, and she went through this long list of things that I've had the opportunity to do in New York State. A little girl in the back put up her hand and said, What's the matter, mister? Couldn't you keep a job? <laughs> Well, good afternoon, and uh, I want to welcome everyone to this uh, event, and particularly because uh, one of its sponsors is the Nelson A. Rockefeller Institute of Government, an organization that uh, SUNY is very, very proud to be uh, involved with. Indeed, RIG, as we affectionately call it, is uh, renowned for taking on tough policy questions that affect all New Yorkers, and particularly those policies that affect uh, our government. And this is certainly an important time to think about our government and how it performs. I want to thank Tom Geis and Bob Bullock at RIG for their involvement in this effort. And uh, the distinguished panel that we're going to hear from uh, really is uh, going to be quite a treat for all of us. Before we begin, I want to set the table on this very interesting and frequently discussed and debated issue of a constitutional convention for New York State. We are fortunate to have some experts in the room today who will uh, have been studying this and really uh, very versed about it, and we look forward to hearing from them. My fellow trustee from SUNY, Hank DeLay, is here. Now, Hank can tell you everything you 
possibly want to know about the last convention in 1967. He can tell you the names of all the people who were there and how they voted on every subject. Uh, so Hank, it is really good to see you. Uh, because, uh, as you know, fundamentally, this is really the point of a constitutional convention. Once every 20 years, our citizens can express their right to change or to amend uh, the Constitution so that we can make sure that it is really giving the kind of direction uh, to our government to perform uh, well and to address the issues that we all think are most important. And folks, you know, I've been in New York state government in various uh, roles for a long time. And I'm telling you that if we were ever at a crossroads in terms of how people feel about government, it is now. I was talking recently to my good friend uh, <coughs> John Dunn. When I served in the Senate, John Dunn was the distinguished chair of the Judiciary Committee. And we talked about what it was like then and what it was like now. In fact, I really sometimes leave off my resume that I was a member of the New York State Senate. <laughs> So uh, things have certainly changed. Currently, there is a widespread feeling of mistrust and disappointment in New York's uh, elected officials in our government. And that's really very difficult because we expect so much more from them. Now, there are some really very good, hardworking public servants in government, and we applaud them. However, when you think about the whole feeling on the part of, of our public about government, it's very different. I called my friend Steve Greenberg at Siena and asked him to give me some information from their latest poll, which was conducted in February of 2016. And they asked questions about government and how people felt about it. The first question was, how serious a problem would you say corruption is in state government in Albany? The response, 89% of the respondents said that it was a serious problem and 53% said that it was a very serious problem. At least 85% of Democrats, Republicans, independents from all parts of the state believe that we have a serious problem of corruption in our state government. The next question was, how serious a problem would you say uh, government is, um, how serious is a problem about in terms of how you feel about your state legislators. 65% uh, says they have no, they do not support them. 30% said they really feel very badly about them and that they should be replaced. So at least uh, some 61% Democrats, Republicans, independents, people from all over have expressed their opinions about our government. And those opinions are not very flattering. In fact, they're disgraceful. And so today we have an opportunity to hear from some people who will talk about the Constitutional Convention and whether this is an opportunity to develop a set of ethical reforms and conduct so that we can feel more confident about our government. A government that lacks confidence is a government that is dysfunctional, it is a government that is disgraceful, it is a government that we can no longer support. Can the Constitution make a difference? We're so pleased today that we have so many distinguished people who are going to come and give us the specifics. What can the Constitution do? What can a Constitutional Convention do to solve this serious problem in, uh, here in New York State where we now lack confidence in the very government upon which we depend? Thank you very much. Please join me again. We, we are privileged to have Chairman McCall with us today. He's truly one of the great public servants in modern New York State history. So please join me in thanking him once again. Well, this afternoon, all of us collectively are going to make a little bit of New York history. Um, we are going to do something I don't think, at least to the best of my knowledge, has ever happened before. There have been programs, events, continuing legal education, seminars about ethics, 
and there have been programs, events, and CLE seminars about the state constitution. But I don't think ever before have those two ideas, the idea of to what extent can the state constitution and a constitutional convention be used as a mechanism to achieve ethics reform, to enhance public faith and trust in government. That's never happened before until this afternoon. So on behalf of all of those people who have worked so hard, I see Tom Gass, I see Bob Bullock, I see representatives of the State Bar Association, Ray, the Government Law Center, Sienna, all of those people, we thank you on a Friday, on a good Friday, on a rainy Friday, with the budget not done, to have this many people come and be with us today to discuss this subject. Well, it underscores, I think, what Chairman McCall pointed out about people searching for ideas to do better. And it also says a lot about all of you to be here to discuss this very, very serious and very complex and sometimes technical subject. So we are making history. What I'm going to do now is just briefly give you an overview of the program, the design of it, um, and then introduce our next speaker. What we present to you today is a four-act drama. Um, we will be hearing momentarily uh, from Richard Brafault, who I will just say before I give you the longer introduction, as great as the Government Law Center is, number one, in terms of government law, I can also tell you the preeminent national scholar of government law in the United States of America is Richard Fault, who we're going to hear about in just a moment. Um, uh, act one, of course, will be Professor uh, Brafault's remarks, uh, which we should all look forward to eagerly. Then we have three different panels, each of which are designed to accomplish different functions. The first panel, um, where there will be four speakers who I'll introduce when we get closer to it, each of whom will talk for about 10 minutes and then we'll do some moderated Q&A. Their focus is to discuss the threshold question. What does the state constitution have to do about ethics? To what extent can a constitutional convention be a mechanism to deal with ethics reform? Uh, a question that prior to the traumas and the lack of trust that Chairman McCall so eloquently described has never squarely been looked at before. And the first panel will sort of address that issue. Panel number two will then move beyond the threshold question to the next question, which is what are the kinds of issues, the substantive issues for which the state constitution might be an appropriate place to embed and bake into, and a constitutional convention might be an appropriate place to debate. The final panel um, will be probably what all of you really are interested in, and we'll want your participation for that, which is a summary discussion. We're going to bring up all our prior speakers. They'll be before you. I might have a few more questions, but then we'll open the floor to hear your questions and hopefully spark and stimulate a, a fascinating debate. I'm confident we will. Uh, and then I may have a few closing remarks. So now let me move to what is a personal privilege for me, which is to introduce Richard Befall, who, as I said before, is I think America's preeminent government law scholar and has been for decades. Um, he is the Joseph P. Chamberlain of Government Law at Columbia Law School, where he has held that chair and been a distinguished professor for many, many years. Uh, in addition to being a noted scholar, not just on government law, he is a distinguished ethicist. Um, not only has he written and spoken on that subject, he also happens to be the reporter for the American Law Institute, which is now tackling the subject of um, ethics. And uh, this is no mere academic who will be pontificating from the top of the ivory tower. This is a man who has been actively involved in the hard work of ensuring compliance with ethics. He is the, um, at the moment, he serves as the chair of the Conflicts of Interest Board of the City of New York. So we are blessed with an individual with vast experience, academic and practical, and it is my honor and privilege to introduce to you Professor Richard Befall. What I can't believe is in that wildly over-the-top introduction, 
and I do intend to pontificate as an academic, uh, in that wildly over-the-top introduction, you owe me to the most important thing from my resume, which is that I used to work here in Albany. The, the start of my working career, I would think I was 26 years old. Uh, I think everyone thought I was 12. Uh, no one thinks that now. Uh, it was when I was an assistant, uh, assistant counsel to Governor New York, Hugh Carey. And it was from that time, and I'm delighted that actually one of my colleagues from that era, Scott Fine is here, and of course the person whose desk I took, uh, Jay Kelleher is here. Uh, I love, much of what I say actually may sound critical of Albany and the legislature and public service, but it all comes out of a background of really being immersed in it and believing in its importance and of its great value. So the extent that, I won't, I won't say it's more in sorrow than in anger, but it's the, anything that comes in, that either sounds like criticism or sounds like reform, comes from somebody whose working career really began in this place and began with an enormous appreciation of what gets done here and maybe more importantly, what could get done here. Uh, so let me start. Um, uh, as you all know, we're, next year there's gonna be a vote on whether or not New York State should have a constitutional convention. If the vote on that convention call is positive, that I believe will be due to the sense that our state government has grown unaccountable to the people. Combination of low voter turnout, gerrymandered legislative districts, increasingly unrestricted campaign spending, and prominent examples of official misconduct um, have really given the sense that our democracy, that is government by trustworthy representatives answerable to the people through competitive elections is at risk. Whether and how constitutional con revision can strengthen our democracy should be a central question, will be a central question, as the debate over whether to hold a convention unfolds. And today, I think, is an important step in beginning the process of that debate. Uh, I begin by pointing out that assuring the accountability of government to the people has long been a central focus of constitution making in New York. And we've been making and remaking our constitution since 1777. Virtually every past constitutional convention has given at least some attention to such basic democratic questions as eligibility to vote, the role of the voters in selecting officials, the apportionment of legislative seats, and the integrity of the political process. What is striking is that these basic issues are once again at the forefront of public concern. Uh, you notice I've, I've been talking a little bit about democracy, uh, yet the topic of today's discussion is ethics. You might want to ask, what does one have to do with the other? To be sure, they're not the same thing, but what they both have in common is a concern with the accountability of public officials to the public. Uh, the central driving principle of government ethics is that public office is a public trust. Public officials have a duty to pursue the public interest, however they define it, and they will surely disagree about what the public interest is, but a duty to pursue their conception of the public interest and a duty not to use public power for their own personal ends. There are many ways to accomplish this goal. Ethics rules aimed at conflicts of interest are one means, but so are competitive elections, fair, fair districting, and campaign finance rules that reduce dependence on private donors. So voting and the electoral process, legislative districting, campaign finance, and formal ethics rules all affect the ability of public officials to serve ethically. Of course, not all of these concerns can be addressed through legal change or state-level legal change. Reforming voter registration and voting practices may not be enough to change our low voter turnout, and the Supreme Court surely has a lot to say about what are permissible campaign finance rules. But for our present purposes right now, the key question is whether and to what extent uh, desirable legal changes need to or should entail constitutional, state constitutional changes. And that's really where I want to begin. Um, and to do that in light of a, a view of thinking about state constitutions, which is that an important strand in thinking about state constitutions today has been the value of simplifying and streamlining them. Or, uh, most state constitutions are wildly longer than the federal constitution. The current New York state constitution is roughly five times the length of the federal constitution. And many constitutions, including our own, have what might be considered statutory, in quotation marks, text, inappropriate for a foundational document, whether we're talking about the ski trails in the Adirondack Park or the tolls in the Erie Canal. Uh, so detailed provisions are more likely to become unsuitable in light of changing social, economic, or technological factors, or to lock in reforms, which may have been reform when, a reform when adopted, but over time proved to be inadequate or ineffective. So a constitution should focus on setting up the structure of government, establishing the basic powers of and constraints on the state, and articulating fundamental values. So the question really for us, I think, is are there constitutional reforms that are specific enough to make a difference, but not so specific as to become an obstacle to future democratic developments? Uh, I'm thinking about this in three parts. 
First, to think about what provisions in the Constitution right now are obstacles to reform. Many reforms can be enacted by ordinary legislation, but not if the Constitution gets in the way. Uh, so constitutional revision, whether through a convention or through an ordinary amendment process, is necessary to clear away these barriers to reform. And I'll talk about a couple in a minute. Uh, second, constitutional provisions may be needed to create the institutions required to effectively oversee and enforce the rules of democratic self-governance in areas like election administration and government ethics. Uh, a major role of constitutions is to design and entrench the institutions by which we govern ourselves. These institutions could be created by ordinary legislation, but then there's the risk that they'll be subject to ongoing tinkering and manipulation in response to changing political pressures. In ethics, for example, the state totally revamped its ethics oversight structure twice in four years, creating a commission on public integrity in 2007 and then replacing it with a commission, joint commission on public ethics in 2011. Such instability and vulnerability to political change is not conducive to having an effective and independent political watchdog. The institutions that oversee and enforce the honest operations of the political process especially need to be insulated from the political process to some degree through entrenchment in the Constitution. Creating these political framework organizations at a constitutional convention rather than through the legislative process could also help separate their design from short-term political considerations. Third, constitutional revision can involve the adoption of new substantive provisions, the direct imposition of new restrictions or requirements, or directives to the legislature mandating that it take or refrain from taking certain actions in order to promote ethical government. These will almost always be measures that do not require constitutional change because they involve actions that the legislature already has the power to take or refrain from taking. Putting them in the Constitution makes sure that desirable policies are in place and undesirable ones precluded, Entrenching them in the Constitution also reflects a certain distrust of the legislature, the concern that the one currently in office will not follow these policies, and that even if it does, future legislatures might pursue a different course. So in addition to deciding whether a constitutional amendment is, in, is needed to guard against legislative indifference to or hostility to these, process, to these policies, we also have the question of whether proper constitutional language can be developed to, to enact them. By that I mean language specific enough to actually bind the legislature and comprehensive enough to fully address the question at issue, but not so specific as to quickly become outdated or inadvertently create loopholes, and not so comprehensive as to be, as to, uh, be unduly rigid and fail to provide for necessary flexibility or exceptions. Do we have Goldilocks language uh, that can do the job? And I want to get to that at the end. Um, a detailed legislative code probably ought not to be entrenched in the Constitution. On the other hand, relatively general hortatory commands of do the right thing may not do much good. So first let me talk briefly about removing some obstacles to reform. I started out with six, and as I realized that my time was already dwindling away, I'm down to four. I pretty sure might be down to two, uh, but I'll try and go through four rather quickly. So I want to talk about four candidates uh, for constitutional provisions that ought to go. Two deal with registration and voting, one interferes with the proper punishment of corrupt officials, and one involves the design of one of our framework institutions, the Board of Elections. Uh, on voting, we need to make voting and registration easier. Voter turnout in New York is abysmal. In the 2014 general election, when the governorship, the other statewide positions, and the entire legislature were on the ballot, turnout was 29% of the voting eligible population, or well below the national average of 37%. New York placed 50th out of 50. Actually, we're 50th 50 out of 51 if you count the District of Columbia. Uh, nor was 2014 an outlier. In 2012, a presidential election year, we came in 46th out of 51. So we don't do so hot on this. Uh, de de repeated depressingly low turnouts, especially in state election years, is tantamount to a vote of no confidence in government. It's not clear how much of this record can be blamed on the, the laws, the, the administrative system, or broader political, social, or even cultural factors, but it's still worthwhile to see if we can strip out of the Constitution anything that gets in the way, and I think there are two things. One is the provision of the Constitution that authorized absentee balloting is relatively narrow um, and does not have the so-called no excuse provision that 29 other state, 27 other states in the District of Columbia has, nor does it provide for mail-in balloting. Three other states have that. One can debate the merits of mail-in versus in-person voting, but it's hard to see why the Constitution should actually preclude it, which it seems to do. 
Second, the Constitution requires the adoption of voter registration laws that require that registration be completed 10 days before an ele- at least 10 days before an election. In some respects, the 10-day rule is generous. Some other states are as much as 30. But then there are other states, uh, 11 currently in place, three have passed it but are only implementing it, that permit same-day or election-day registration. Uh, which would certainly, given that most people's interest in the election rises dramatically as the election gets closer, that would certainly be one day, one way to make the registration easier. Again, we can debate whether election day or or same day registration is desirable. There are questions of implementation, but it's hard to see why the Constitution should prohibit it. Uh, Turning to the question of dealing with corruption, as everyone in this room probably knows, on Monday, November 30th, the Speaker of the Assembly was convicted of seven counts of corruption. Uh, three days later, he submitted the paper for a state pension. That could amount to as much as $98,000 a year. On December 11th, uh, 2015, the Senate Majority Leader was convicted of eight counts of corruption. Eleven days later, he filed for his state pension, which is estimated to come to $95,000 a year. A pension is deferred compensation, earned for work undertaken in office, but should someone who flagrantly abuses the public's trust while in office be compensated for his misconduct? I think not. Uh, In 2011, the legislature voted to deny pension benefits to public officials convicted of certain felonies related to holding public office. That applies only to people who enter the retirement system as of 2011, not to people who are already there. In order to make to adopt, to provide for the forfeiture of pensions of, leg- of people who entered the system, not just legislators who entered the system prior to 2011, a constitutional amendment would be necessary because uh, the pensions provision of the Constitution prohibits diminishing or impairing constitu- uh, the, the pensions of people in the system. So we would need an amendment for that. The legislature has struggled with that amendment for several years, but has been unable to actually produce one. Uh, finally, in terms of the, the hit list of things that ought to go, is the design, the constitutionally mandated design of the boards of elections, the state board of elections and all the county ones, which mandates that they be simultaneously bipartisan with equal representation of the two major political parties and that their members be picked as nominees of the representatives of such parties. Well, there's surely something to be said for not having the board of elections dominated by a single party. This bipartisan, party-driven structure has created a a dysfunctional institution with a bipartisan duopoly that is hardwired into the Constitution. As the report of the Moreland Act Commission, the one report it was actually able to produce, uh, states the board's bipartisan, this is the state board's bipartisan structure inhibits and at times prevents significant enforcement action from being taken. The board has failed to carry out its duty to enforce the election law, enabling the culture of corruption in Albany. The board simply lacks the structural independence necessary to serve as a watchdog for our campaigns and elections. Its party-based structure has resulted in political stalemate and inaction. One crucial item of the democratic reform agenda would be to amend the Constitution to restructure the Board of Elections and the county-level boards that are subject to the same mandate to make them more independent of the parties and more capable of taking decisive action. Uh, Turning from what should go out to what should go in, uh, first, we, and this is the Board of Elections is a good place to start. I don't say get rid of it, I say fix it. More generally, I think we need to entrench our political watchdog institutions. The institutions that set up and enforce the rules that govern the political process. While they cannot and probably should not ever be entirely outside of politics, they should be constitutionalized in order to reduce the temptation to manipulation for short-term political gain and to put some space between the watchdogs and the, process, the processes and people they are watching. There is precedent for this. As noted, we actually have a board of elections in the Constitution, and we also have, as a result of a recent constitutional amendment, an independent redistricting commission. They may be flawed in design. One of the things I wanted to talk about is the lack of independence of the independent redistricting commission, but the idea of putting them in the Constitution is right, even if there are problems with the current design. To them, I would add a state ethics commission or state ethics board and possibly a campaign finance board. Ethics and campaign finance are also concerns for our fundamental concerns for our political process. The institutions that oversee them ought to have the status, the stability, and the semi-detachment from day-to-day politics that constitutional entrenchment can provide. Constitutional status can enhance their role. It is difficult to imagine an ethics commission that is the creature of the legislative process effectively responding to legislative misconduct. 
This is not a comment on our, on our own legislature. This is a fundamental problem with the policing of legislative ethics nationwide, including Congress. It is very, very difficult for any institution to police itself. It's asking a lot of the institution. Better is to create, a, a, is to create in the Constitution an institution with the power to do that. A Constitutional Ethics Commission would be able to oversee and to take an integrated approach to problems of ethics in the entire government. I'm a little less certain about a Constitutional Campaign Finance Board, whether there should be a new institution that does that, or just one that, 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 uh, that is part of the functions of a reform board of elections. Some states combine the two functions into a single body, some states keep them separate. Much will, determine, will depend on the scope of our campaign finance laws. Uh, a public funding system uh, with all the administrative responsibility that that would entail would probably benefit from a freestanding board. Less ambitious campaign finance regulation might be handled by a reformed board of elections. Uh, I'll address the wisdom of a substantive set of rules that address uh, ethics and campaign finance in a second, but I do want to make the point that you could have an ethics, you could have a constitutionalized ethics board without constitutionalizing the ethics rules. We do that with elections. Uh, the, election, the Board of Elections, this, this, uh, the, the Constitution says very little about what the rules are for, vote, for, the, for the voting process for, uh, for voting and registration, except for the couple that I mentioned. Uh, but we have a Constitutional Board of Elections without having constitutionalized the rules of voting and the rules of registration. Um, I think we could, there's no illogic in having a constitutional um, ethics commission or ethics board without constitutionalizing the ethics rules. Indeed, I think the real problem with our ethics system is not with the rules. We actually have a pretty decent set of rules on the books in the public officer's law. It's with their administration and enforcement. And that's where an effective, independent, nonpartisan ethics board could make a difference. And that is something more likely to come through the constitutional revision process than from the ordinary political process. What should such a board, a reform board of elections, look like? Uh, that's, that, I think we'll take the next year and a half to discuss that, but I have a couple of things that probably ought to go into it. And I'm tempted to say what they should look like is the opposite of what we now have, uh, talking about both the Board of Elections and j -Cope. They should be smaller. 14 is ridiculous. Uh, there should be a smaller size along the lines of, say, five. They should not be even as the Board of Elections or j is, which is a recipe uh, for deadlock. Uh, they should not have bizarre voting rules and bizarre majority forming rules. There should, most importantly, there should not be designated slots for specific partisan office holders to fill. There should be instead longish, relatively staggered terms designed to actually professionalize and to somewhat separate these boards from the political process in which they sit. Again, not completely separate, but to some extent. And probably we should use some kind of filtering mechanism for the appointments akin to the judicial nominating commission in the Constitution that is now used to propose nominees for the courts of appeals. The politicians have a role in proposing the pool of people who will screen uh, to sit on these boards, but there should be some separation uh, between the political, the political people who are regulated by these boards and the membership of the boards themselves. But the design of such a board is clearly a subject worthy of extended discussion. Uh, turning from the institutions, and I think I've got a couple of minutes left, or I've already gone over, whatever. Uh, only a couple more minutes. Um, that's, that's, the, uh, that's the pontificating part that he warned you about. Um, <laughs> turning from the institutions to the substantive rules, what should the Constitution say about voting, campaign finance, and ethics? We already have rules on redistricting, the ones that were adopted a couple of years ago that have yet to be worked on, so it's hard to comment on how well they will work. These are all areas where the legislature already has the power to enact a reform agenda, to, uh, to adopt early voting or automatic registration or limits on outside income closing the LLC loophole, improving disclosure, uh, provide for public, uh, public funding of campaigns. This can all be done right now without a constitutional amendment. Should any of these be placed in the Constitution? And here we have a trade-off, I think, and I alluded to that at the opening. On the one hand, uh, in the face of legislative inaction, if not resistance or hostility, putting these matters in the Constitution gets them done uh, and entrenches them against future resistance. On the, other, on the other hand, many of these matters require relatively detailed rules, definitions, specifications, exceptions, um, with the resulting possibilities that they will either be overly restrictive, too rigid, or create unintended loopholes. By covering A, B, and D, we have left out C. It is hard to imagine including a fully worked out public funding system in the state constitution, and even if we could, that is a system that will likely have to be revised 
in light of, in light of experience of how it works and possibly in light of changing background rules governing campaign finance law. Even something as relatively narrow and specific as a ban on LLC contributions or a limit on outside income will require careful definition and possibly revisions over time. Um, in short, the basic principles appropriate for a constitution may be too general to be effective, and detailed rules may be too statutory to be appropriate for a constitution. When I say too statutory, it sounds like it's an, an aesthetic objection, and maybe there's a little of that, but what I really mean is by requiring, but once you start putting in a lot of details, if any of those details prove mistaken, you need another constitutional amendment to change them. And so it's really the, the rigidity of the details that's the problem and not the fact that it looks funny in a constitution. You've gotta be awfully sure that you've got it right if you wanna put it in the constitution. One possibility might be to adopt directives to the legislature to adopt certain reforms like public funding or limits on outside income or limits on contributions from all sources but not specify the details. This would still <coughs> require legislative implementation and essentially trust that the legislature will follow through. <coughs> but at least the, but the existence of a constitutional amendment with the possibility of judicial enforcement might provide the necessary push for getting it done. I'm not optimistic, but it is a third possibility and maybe something that's worth discussing. Uh, perhaps I'm overstating the difficulties of putting things in the Constitution. Having worked a lot on both government ethics and campaign finance, I am struck by the complexity of the rules necessary to implement what seem like pretty straightforward basic principles. But maybe I'm too close, and maybe this is the problem of being too much of a specialist as I'm too struck with the, too, too obsessed with the trees and don't fully see the forest. So maybe I'm wrong. Uh, I, this is clearly an issue that needs to be discussed, and it sounds like some of the rest of today's panels are going to do it. Uh, but I do leave this as an issue for those in the reform community uh, who think that the con constitutional revision on the substance is the way to go, to, to puzzle out over the next 18 months or so and to figure out whether there are actual constitutional measures that would sufficiently advance these goals but, uh, without doing so uh, in ways that are unduly rigid and unduly specific, and that would be sufficiently useful that would support the call for a convention. Okay.